welcome to the stage, Nihao. And I'm not even going to try to say his last name because I think he would strangle me if I did. Um, Nihao, um, come on up, Nihao. He's one of our Zeke uh, leadership team members. He also works for Mozilla. And with that, I'm turning the stage over to you. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so it was 2012 when I got a message from my boss. My boss was like, hey, I got you new, some new servers. I was like, that's not what you usually hear from your director of security. You usually have to like ask for them. And I was like, given something. Okay, I can do it. I can take it. I like it. And he was like, you're going to run this security onion. Okay, whatever security onion was. Uh, back then, I did not know it was such a fantastic distribution and like an entry level into the way of, uh, way of doing the Zig network monitoring. And he was like, hey, we're gonna build the network security monitoring platform. And back then, I was quite an IDS guy, snort guy, snort anyone here? Yeah. And he was like, hey, we're gonna do basically two major things. We will write some arbitrary detection logic and we will store metadata about connections. I asked, what connections? And he was like, connections, all of them. I'm like, at the data center scale. Back then, Mozilla had like seven data centers, 11 offices or so. And I was like, hey, uh, it's 2012, everything is encrypted. We've got like 100 gigabits of traffic, internal traffic. He wanted to tap the internal traffic. And I was like, yeah, that's a great idea. Unfortunately, uh, it cannot be done. Case closed. Like, just like this. <laughs> I later realized when I was given an excellent chance, I was like, yeah, no, it's, I'm not even trying. So when I tried, I saw this, back then it was called bro process, stealing precious CPU cycles from uh, my snort. I was like, how dare you? Like, I'm gonna like remove this bro thing. <laughs> I was like, uh, that's what your assignment is about. I'd rather see you remove other parts. Okay. So I've got this thing when I, it's not longer the back of my laptop, but it was. I've got this thing when I do question authority. But you know, great leaders can inspire you sometimes. So here we are, and we've got one of the most exciting uh, Zeek uh, installations I have uh, seen so far. And we use Zeek for a couple of, uh, couple of reasons. First of all, we want to record threat actors' activity because we realized, hardly a discovery, that in order to uh, find whatever the attacker was doing on your network, you have to record your own actions. So we record everything in the network, uh, intra VLAN traffic, uh, uh, access to internet, from internet, whatever. Everything that we record is used for basically incident response. Uh, we match IOCs. I will not spend uh, much time talking about IOCs. In fact, I removed slides about IOCs yesterday because there was like so many of them. But we match everything that you could think is an IOC in like the most unusual places. The reason we like uh, Zeek so much, talk to me after this talk in one of these breaks, how we do IOC matching. But for IOC, we consider like everything. Every part of SSL certificate, we try to match on it. Every, if you see a host name, we will try to match this host name in not just the DNS query, but also answer the host header for the HTTP, the SSL SNI, uh, the various fields in the SSL certificate, and so on and so forth. With Zeek, this kind of extensibility is very easy. We wrote a bunch of scripts. Those scripts are gonna be public after this talk. And we kind of try to map attackers' tactics and procedures. And that's the more difficult one, but we wrote a bunch of summary statistics scripts, and the detection mostly works. So we do all of it to answer the most important question our team is being asked on a daily basis. And that's our question. So basically we have kind of like this rotation. And by rotation I mean we have like people on duty responding to alerts. And 
the name of the rotation unofficially, it's called Are We Owned? Hey, are you, are you on the out or are we on the rotation today? No, he is on the rotation, like whatever. And yeah, uh, whenever we see a new report, we at least have like this capability to go back, use Zeek as a time machine and see, hey, all of these IOCs from this new report, have we seen them so far? Maybe we saw them in the past, maybe like half a year before. I could play this slide and go home, I know. <clears throat> okay, so you are like listening to me like grumbling 9 a.m. Thank you for this. And you are like, hey, what is it for me? Well, I want to teach you how to build a nice Zeek sensor. I will not spend much time, well, not any time from now, talking about uh, our detection, but I will talk a lot about the AF packet stuff and how you can build the sensor on a commodity hardware on chip so it's actually fast. Uh, if you already have a working AF packet, do not leave. I know there is coffee outside and everything, but do not leave, because I will tell you two things. I want you to improve what you already have, and I'm here to tell you um, bad news. Your monitoring is wrong. I mean, so is mine, so, you know. So, I promised AF packet. AF packet it is. But one thing before um, AF packet, just answering some questions that were like around. Okay, so how many events per second do you log from your Zeek? 10,000 or more. What do you tap? We tap everything from the internet to the internet and VLAN to VLAN traffic. So intra VLAN traffic, no, but inter VLAN traffic, yes. What do you use for shipping uh, logs or where do you ship logs? We use syslog ng. Syslog ng reads JSON logs from Zeek and parses them, well, does not really do much parsing, sends them over to uh, our own sim, which is called MOSDEF. We do not use Splunk, we wrote our own thing. We use Clear Linux. Clear Linux is like a quite fresh Linux distribution from Intel. And the, the reason I like it is first of all, we got a tons of support from Intel. Thank you, Intel. And second, uh, they brought up this distribution without even thinking before, like what were the previous distribution made like? Like they, are, they made everything from scratch, asking themselves like a single question. If we today were to make a modern Linux distribution without all this heritage, without all this baggage, what would it look like? And they came up with this. And yeah, we, our, Separate set of clusters spans a couple of continents. We do a lot of correlation, not at the Zig layer, but also at the C layer. So Mozilla sensor, the newest one. I went through many revisions because from time to time to kind of, hey, give something to community thing. I buy a new generation <coughs> of hardware, new generation of network cards, and we just build a new sensor to test some hardware or to refresh it. Uh, just beefy sensors. A lot of RAM, a lot of uh, network cards. Uh, you see here that each sensor has two network cards. You will see in a minute why. So there was a lot of talking about hardware acceleration in the community, like you have to bypass Linux inefficient network stack, that you have to accelerate the packet capture process. And a couple of years ago, in 2016, we came up uh, with, <coughs> sorry about it, Seattle. Uh, we came up with this uh, research, me, uh, we being myself and one of the uh, Suricata developers for the second version of the document, even more developers joined it. So these are documents that you might think are not relevant to uh, Zeek. I would say give them a try. Mm, because they described how do you accelerate a AF packet capture sensor and how do you configure Suricata for the best performance. So those of you who also use the other solutions for network security monitoring, you might have some fun with it. But it describes a lot of like generic high level tuning, including like very low level stuff. Uh, things that could be very useful for your Zeek sensors as well. And what we did, we called it Suricata Extreme Performance Tuning. So what we did is we 
brought Suricata up to speed, up to 40, not 14, 40 uh, gig, gigabits per second. No packet loose, about 40,000 rules that were expecting traffic, inspecting traffic. We did it on like a commodity hardware like the one you saw before. Um, yeah, these are the papers where, where we basically describe it. You will not be able to reach this kind of speeds with Zeek. I will talk about it later. So, you know, we spend a lot of time doing this research. <clears throat> but before I can explain to you why we made some decisions we made, I'd like to kind of walk you through what the packet capture looks on Linux like. Let's take a, a look at what is the day of a life of a packet being captured on a Linux system. So, I hope it is more or less visible from, from everywhere. But basically, on the left, you have a network card, which I bravely allowed myself to draw. I should never be doing it, whatever. Uh, and packets enter the FIFO queue, just to get some time. And the card, first of all, the card uh, does, after the packet enters the FIFO queue, is it uh, uses the DMA, uh, engine to copy the packet to the host memory. The important thing to remember here, your generic network cards have a very limited FIFO uh, buffer. It's like 500 kilobytes or less or more, sometimes like one megabyte. It is not there to buffer anything, it's just to buy some time to repacket the packet, if it makes any sense, into PCI Express. Okay, so we've got the packet. It arrived. It was moved over to the host memory. Uh, and then the card is like, hey, Linux system, you have a packet over there at this web, at, at, this, uh, at this page, so how about you do something about it? And what the Linux does is it responds immediately with, okay, I got it, I will get to it. So it acknowledges the interrupt request and it exits what is a very costly path. It exits the interrupt uh, Handling, uh, handling code. And then Linux does something else. Like this is one of the things about like modern systems. They do not get to process packet right away. They will like get to other tasks and they will be like, I will get to it when I get to it. But I have it. So all of this time packet is sitting in the host memory. There is this more or less ring buffer it looks like everything by donut uh, in the middle. It's just a set of descriptors that point to a memory page where the, buffer, where the packet is located. Sometime later, Linux is like, okay, I'm gonna do something about the packet. So what it does, it wakes up one of these uh, K-soft IRQ demons. You will see it when you like PS whatever and do grab I. Uh, RQ. Uh, Those are what I called uh, soft net thread, uh, threads, kernel threads. They take care of the packet processing after the time when packet was sent to the host memory to the very end. To the very end, unless you use something called RPS that we will not talk about here. If you don't know what it is, it's okay because you don't use it. Uh, all of this processing stays in the same kernel thread and all of this processing stays on the same uh, CPU that first of all acknowledged the original interrupt request. And Linux is like, I'm gonna take the packet and I'm gonna repackage it into something called SKB, which is a socket buffer structure. Important thing to remember here, Linux does not copy the packet into a separate structure 20,000 times. It just does some crazy stuff with pointers pointing back from the structure to the page with the packet, it's actually complicated. Okay, so we have our structure, and when it has been created, we can finally uh, remove the packet from the network card 5 q It gets done automatically, it's just 5 and it's kind of like a circle buffer, so it, all their uh, packets are get, uh, overwritten automatically. And Another important thing to note here, which is also a great source of confusion, 
Linux does not copy it into an AF packet. What Linux does, it's doing an SKB clone. So it creates yet another structure describing the same packet, also pointing back to the original memory page for, SK, uh, for AF packet. And it removes the first structure because it like, goes nowhere. So at this point, you are left with uh, yet another uh, ring, who doesn't like rings, and you have AFP ring, something that you are familiar with, something that you are probably configuring uh, in, in the past, that describes where packets are located. When there is enough of those packets in the ring, they get mapped into the user space again with no data copying. And your Zeek can access the, um, your Zeek can finally access the traffic. So, the summary of this part is the network card copies the packet to the host memory, the host gets to it whenever it wants, and it does a lot of interesting data shuffling and a lot of pointers mathematic to avoid copying the packet in, uh, and repackages into different data structures. Uh, I wish it was very easy. Uh, unfortunately, modern cards like the Intel X710, X720, they are not just network cards. They're like entire data centers in a box. Like this card is like, what, two, three hundred dollars? And it's like an entire data center in a box. It has a managed switch. Uh, it has like three, four hundred virtual network interfaces. And other cards from like Mellanox and other vendors have similar powers. The good thing is you can access all of these powers from AF Packet. Uh, and when doing this research, we focused a lot on figuring out, hey, what is the source of packet drops on a Linux system? And we were surprised to learn two things. First of all, uh, the whole talk about like, hey, your solution is not zero copy and mine is. Well, efficiently, AF packet version three is zero copy. So there's that. And it's not so much about like copying packets around. You have packet drops not because you are running out of bandwidth somewhere when copying packets to the user space, you are running out of time to process a packet. It's all about per packet latency, and that's what uh, Luigi from the NetMap project actually helped me understood. Not that he knows about it, but me help, that he helped me understood it. I was, just, I was just reading papers, and his papers are excellent. And he was the first one, he was like, the first one to say was like, hey, you have only this so much time to process a single packet, and the whole like, you know, zero copy thing, it's a nice thing to have, but it comes last. <clears throat> so let's see what will eat your time per packet. Well, at 10 gigabits per second, uh, you have about like 60 nanoseconds to process a packet if you, if you have like a stream of like a minimal size packets. So there's like 200 cycles on a modern CPU. That is not a lot. So if you have something what we call cache trashing, so like a CPU is spending a lot of time waiting for data, you are not gonna be able to process a single packet in 200 cycles. So we started looking at, hey, how, how can we avoid wasting time and how can we put the CPU to work so it works all the time and it does not have to wait for the, um, uh, uh, for the data access. Uh, it comes as a no, no surprise. I found it on some uh, interweb pages. Hey, access to a local L3 cache is relatively fast. It's like 20 nanoseconds. But if you try to copy the packet from the memory, it's like four times, five times the same. If you try to access a packet on a remote NUMA node, it's a disaster. So after carefully tuning, uh, carefully tuning our sensors, we are pleased to tell that, hey, before tuning, our CPU was like mostly waiting for data. So if you don't have your AF packet sensor uh, tuned correctly right now, that's, it, that's where it's sitting if it has any packet loss. And it has like not even one instruction per cycle because it's waiting for data. After tuning, we jumped to 2.7 instructions per cycle. The theoretical limit of the Intel architecture and AMD architecture is about four. That's like the ideal uh, scenario, so, yep. 
And we figured out, okay, let's design a pipeline. Let's design a pipeline so we take the best care of our data so they are not lost in the process. So, we saw me previously telling that the packet arrives to the card uh, internal buffer. Every modern network card will right away write the packet to not only host memory, but also to the cache of the CPU that will be processing it. It is super important because you, for free, are gonna get a cache hit in the next uh, time you try to process this packet. So if the card was nice enough to copy the packet to the uh, cache for us, uh, hey, how about we use it and don't lose it? So our grand plan for each of our sensors looks like this, and I have two ways to describe our plan. First in is more or less in English. Second one is the diagram on the next slide. So what we do is we do per flow load balancing. So if you have like a flow between A and B and B and A, we, sell, we sell, uh, uh, send all of this flow to the same core uh, using per flow load balancing. And since the flow is already has been processed by the kernel on some core, we want Zeek to process it on the same core. So flows are not moved between parts of the CPU wasting time. Uh, we decided to dedicate some cores on the machine to the soft E and uh, hardware interrupt request processing. So give system some cores just for the system and give the rest of your server to your, uh, to your Zeek. It will make more sense later. So this is more or less the architecture here. I always wanted to try this. Mm probably does not work well. Uh, eh. uh, you have your CPU, and on this CPU, we just reserved here like first and second core, just for doing the network processing here, and for doing like, you know, extra stuff that system has to do, like run SSHD or syslog or whatever. And we also run on those cores things like Zig log, Zig proxy, Zig manager, uh, process and so on and so forth. And then we isolate, this is a key word here, isolate our cores to do nothing else but Zig data processing. To achieve something like this, you first of all have to do a symmetry hashing of a flow. So you need to know, you have to make sure that the flow from A to B and the flow from B to A goes to the same worker. Obviously, Zig needs to see both sides of the connection to work correctly. If you have a highly asymmetrical network, you know what I'm talking about. And uh, I will say this. Uh, for a number of years, we recommended the software uh, hashing in AF packet called cluster flow. Uh, some Suricata developers actually noticed something interesting. They implemented this check mechanism because, by the way, we troubleshoot our Zig with uh, Suricata and we troubleshoot our Suricata with Zig. I mean, why not? Uh, so there is a special, uh, special piece of code in the Suricata code that also allowed us to discover problems on our Zig sensors. When you have fragmented packets, uh, the built-in the kernel cluster flow sometimes does not reassemble them correctly. So if you have fragmented packets from A to B, some of those pass packets will go to a different worker, and then you have a problem. Unfortunately, this is because it does not reassemble everything correctly, so the cluster flow does the hashing using source IP address, destination IP address, source port, and the destination port. Now, if your packet is fragmented, it does not have those ports, so the hashing mechanism is like, uh, yeah, I'm gonna hash on whatever is left here, and it sends flows to, to different workers. So we decided to try something else. Uh, there is a new hotness that I will not be talking about called eBPF. eBPF can actually fix it for you, but that's next year talk. And there is also hardware hashing. So the card itself can calculate the hash, and this hash can be used by AF packet to send uh, flows to different workers. And the nice thing about it is with, with hardware, it is actually flexible. Uh, it is not yet with software. Uh, fortunately or not fortunately, depending how you look at it, uh, 
hardware has a number of interesting capabilities. So if you look at how the Intel card decides where to send a packet, then the card is like, okay, did the ATR said something. You don't need to worry about it here. I'm gonna just recommend for you to disable it. It was some interesting mechanism for Intel that never worked correctly. So let's say this one is disabled. The flow goes to what is called perfect filters. And those filters can like drop the packet or redirect to one of the queue or to one of the workers. And finally you have RSS which calculates the hash according to the way you direct it. This is important. So ATR, like I said, don't worry what it is. Just disable. Oh, and by the way, all of these commands and everything that you see here, everything is in the GitHub repository as of right now, and there is a link for the GitHub repository at the last slide to make sure no one is running away and grabbing coffee. Or if you are, then you have to go back, unfortunately. I'm sorry. But everything I have here, including this whole talk, this whole presentation, and every single of these commands are in the GitHub, so you'll be able to use it like this plus there is a couple of extras. So no need to like take screenshots of like badly visible uh, screenshots of, of my desktop. Mm. The nice thing uh, not many people use about uh, Intel cards, uh, Mellanox cards, are these on hardware filtering capabilities. Uh, right here I'm showing you an example. Hey, I don't want to see syslog traffic because there is no point in uh, zig logging syslog, I already log syslog using other means, so I can tell the card, hey, if you see it, send it to the queue number minus one, which means drop it. Uh, the Intel card is nice because it allows you to have those hardware filters and you can have thousands of them and they run wire speed and there is no penalty whatsoever and they are fully supported in the Linux that you have. So just use them. There is only one catch. For the Intel, uh, they are called perfect filters, but I call them way too perfect filters, because if you have first filter that filters on the source port, then the next one cannot be filtering on the destination. Everything else has to be written in the same way. So you either filter on a source or destination, or you don't. For Mellanox cards, and Mellanox cards are also like two, three hundred dollars, kind of like Intel, uh, you can mix those filters, which is nice. Okay, our flow went through the perfect filters and they didn't say anything interesting. And here we start configuring our RSS. So first of all, important thing to remember, to avoid problems with uh, fragmentation, you have to tell RSS, uh, only calculate the hash on like uh, three tuple. Protocol, uh, source, and destination do not touch any ports. So that's what we do here. Uh, then, hey, okay, how do you actually calculate this hash? RSS has this history, and probably many of you know, uh, that, hey, RSS is traditionally understood as something that will not hash symmetrically. So it's, uh, so it's not really useful for any kind of uh, network security monitoring. The good news is on any modern network card, you can actually configure the RSS so it is symmetric. Uh, again, an interesting answer from Intel, because the card can do symmetric hashing on hardware using a different hash than RSS. And they rejected a patch for ETH tool that the Suricata developer wrote, and they don't want us to use it. They were like, no, just use the RSS and change the hashing key to a symmetric one. Whatever. So you can configure it to be symmetric, and then you have something that is called the redirection table. I will not go into details on it, but it's like, hey, if the result from the hash is eight, then send it to the core number two. If it's nine, send it to core number three, and so on and so forth. Uh, you can actually use, you configure this table yourself, and you can, uh, you can have a great deal of flexibility here. So, we've got our hashing consistency dealt with. Like, we hash free double. And, oh, important thing, this is also uh, important for your packet broker. If you have something like Arista, gig, uh, I will not speak about Gigabar because I have no idea how it works, but like Arista, that does not do flow reassembly in front of your cluster. You have to configure your uh, packet broker to only hash on source, destination, and uh, protocol type, because if you include uh, source and destination ports, then, it will, uh, then your packet broker, which sits in front of your cluster, could possibly be sending parts of the same flow to different physical sensors. 
So basically you want to like maintain this consistency. I hash three tuple from the very beginning to the very end and I do not do it at any <coughs> other stage. Okay, so our flow successfully made it the way to our server and it's being processed by Zeek. I will show you the configuration of the Zeek later, but something interesting that we found and I will be uh, sharing these findings as we go through the, through the talk is uh, instead of buying giant box with a high, high, high number of cores, like 40, 50 cores, buy a box with a smaller number of cores, but make them faster. Let me tell you why. This is the internal uh, representation of the, uh, what is it, uh, Broadwell. And this is the inter uh, the next one will be the representation of the Skylake CPU. You have, you see those rings here on the CPU, right? In the previous slide, I told you that there is like a one giant block of L3 cache where all the packets happily coexist. Well, I was kind of lying to you because each of these cores has only a small slice of this cache and each core is free to use cache from other cores. So it's one giant mm, cache but it's divided ac across execution units. So if execution unit, for example, this one here wants to access, this is all the same CPU. If this execution unit wants to access something here, it has to go like this. Up here, through the ring, to the controller, through the ring, down here, and here. So if you have a lot of cores, those things are getting complicated and that's why I'm basically recommending getting a machine with like a smaller number of faster cores rather than investing into too many cores. Similar stuff for Skylake. Only Skylake is kind of smarter, so if the core here wants to access data here, it will go like, like this. Mm. Okay, what else? Uh, when configuring the BIOS, firmware, e EFI, whatever you have, you will see a number of options. Some of the options I present here, some of the options are explained in the uh, Septun uh, paper in more details, but just to quickly go through them to get some time for uh, troubleshooting and, and questions. If you see uh, something for like cache coherence or like home snooping, early snooping, just enable early snooping and ask me later if you want to know details. I could write a separate talk about it. Uh, Skylake and previous generations have something called sub NUMA clustering, just disable. Uh, what else? Uh, every CPU has P states and C states without going into details. Uh, for the maximum performance we just discovered that it's better to disable P states, but leave C states enabled so CPU when it has, when a core has nothing to do, can go to like a partial sleep not a complete sleep, but can like stop executing. And it gives it some thermal headroom. So it gets cooler. As it gets cooler, the next time a packet hits the CPU, it can turbo boost over the nominal frequency. So some C states are actually nice to generate this thermal headroom to let your co cores cool down. So when there is a more demand for like the data processing, they can overclock automatically. If you completely disable C states, turbo boost stops working. Uh, what else? People always are asking us for the hyper-threading. We discovered that it's fine to use hyper-threading, but for the Zeek worker course, not for like the interrupt processing course or something. Uh, and super important, uh, familiarize yourself with the physical uh, capabilities of your server. If your server has four, six memory channels, use all of them. Buy smaller memory modules, but use all of the memory channels. I saw, I, I was reading an article from uh, Fujitsu yesterday. They claim that it's between uh, 80, in the worst case, to like 25% loss of performance if you don't do the uh, configuration of the memory correctly. Uh, talk to your server vendor how to do it for your server, but you want to load balance your memory across all of the memory channels in the best way possible using equal sized DIMM modules uh, to maximize throughput between the CPU and the memory, obviously. Uh, and never ever go, well, you cannot do on Skylake, but on the previous architectures, do not go be behind uh, two DIMMs per channel because the frequency goes down. 
some other surprise thing that I learned from the Intel developer who actually wrote the original driver, uh, I was like, hey, I'm having this packet loose, and can we make this uh, bu buffer? This is the buffer, by the way, that the card uh, sends packets to right after the reception, like the host memory area. And I was like, hey, can we make it even bigger than what the driver allows? Because I'm having this packet loose. And he was like, you don't want to make it bigger. You want to make it smaller. And, that's, and here's why. Uh, I'm recommending something that may come as a shock to, uh, to some. Uh, if you don't oversize your buffers, whatever those buffers are, then the, well, they have to be described in somewhere. They have to be a description structure uh, for the CPU to know where this buffer is. And this buffer is made of multiple memory pages, kind of like in a ring. Uh, the structure describing where are all of the memory pages from the buffer, they need to fit in the CPU cache. If you make the buffer big, then you have 4,000 pages, then the structure that describes where those pages are is gonna get huge, and every time you access your buffer, you have a cache miss. I hope it makes at least a little bit of sense, but basically, I would say start with something low and you have packet drops, Tune it up, suit yourself, but do not try to make every packet huge, uh, every buffer huge. Uh, again, this talk is going to be published, so you will be able to play with these commands. But some helpful commands I gathered around to discover: Hey, what my hardware actually looks like? What does it mean to have these CPUs connected to the first NUMA? Where is my network card connected? Uh, all of this is described in the Septune and uh, in the GitHub repository as well. Uh, one tool that I'd like to uh, point out to is the LSTOPO. It's a very cool line, uh, it's a very cool tool because it allows you to uh, graphically represent what the server uh, structure is like from the system uh, point of view. So here you are like, hey, I have like uh, two different NUMA nodes, right? NUMA second, NUMA first. In the first one, I have all of these cores connected and have all of this cache, and I have my capture card connected, as you can see, to the first NUMA node, not to the second one. So where do you want to run your ZIG? You want to run your ZIG here, because you have network card that goes to the CPUs right away. So yeah, LSTOPO is a very powerful tool, and you can pro you have to probably install it from the source code, but it's well worth the trouble. Some other things that we discovered very quickly: uh, fresh kernel version. Uh, there was this thing when everyone was using the kernel driver from the source forge uh, from the E1000 project for Intel. There is no need to do it anymore. Uh, keep your firmware updated. Talk to your firmware vendor, I mean, your server vendor, how to do it. Uh, and we've got some options to configure the kernel. First of all, we disable something that is called IO uh, memory management unit. Talk to me later if you want to know what, it, what this one is about. Uh, we limit the C states. We disable something called uh, PC active state power management. So the PCI is not trying to save uh, energy by disabling the bus when it has nothing to do, because before it enables the bus, you might have packet drops on the card. So like packets arrive, the card is trying to send packets to the host the memory, and the PCI bus is like, wait a second, I was sleeping. <laughs> uh, and what you see here at the bottom of it, this is the important stuff, these ISOL CPUs lets you isolate some CPUs from any system tasks. So here I'm saying, do not run anything on the cores 4 to 21 and cores 32 to 48. What it does, it, it removes them from the scheduler. Nothing will be scheduled there, almost nothing. And then you, through the ZIG configuration, can tell, hey, ZIG, you are only the one that can use those cores. Uh, some additional stuff to move, like timers and other kernel threads. You basically use all of these uh, parameters with the same number of cores and everything just works. You set a, what I call a, a interrupt affinity. Uh, so it means you tell the card and you tell the system, hey, only core zero to three, so one, two, three, four, is allowed to process the kernel part of the data processing. 
and cores like 4 to 21 will be only ZIG cores. So if you want to have your network traffic processed from the card by only like first, fair, uh, first four cores, you set the uh, interrupt affinity to zero to three and uh, packets will not be processed by any other cores. Uh, very this, this script is in my GitHub repository, it comes from Intel. And yeah, I just made the copy just in case it like goes away. Uh, configure ZIG, obviously. Something less obvious here is I use the pin CPU also for the manager, for the logger, for the proxy, to just pin everything that does not process packets <coughs> somewhere else where, somewhere else than the cores actually processing packets, somewhere else than workers. Yes, yeah, that's a great question. So if you want to move other processes, like you say, SSHD, if in the previous one here, you see this ISO CPUs option. If you boot your system with something like this, try it for yourself, boot it with like zero. It removes every core from the scheduler, so automatically nothing will be run on cores that are uh, mentioned here. And because we did something like this, uh, we have to pin CPUs for workers. We can actually tell, hey, Zeke, uh, please go ahead and actually use those uh, cores that I gave to you for the, for the isolation. You can configure AF packet buffer size. Do not make it too big, again, try with something small, one megabyte, two megabytes, and go like exponentially, eight, 16, see what works for you. And again, uh, make, if you see, still see drops, maybe you should actually do it at the beginning. Hey, do you have your PCI X8 card in PCI X8 slot electrically? What I'm saying is sometimes you have a server and it has PCI 8 slot, but it is actually PCI 4 slot, but it's only extra white, but there are no electrical contacts under it. So make sure you read the server-friendly manual. Uh, Make sure that the PCI slot is uh, V3. And another thing that will probably surprise some of you, I'm telling you to disable prefetching, data, data prefetching, not instructor prefetching, but data prefetching uh, in, in the configuration of, the, of, the, of your server. And that's because and that's because uh, we took care so much of like making sure that the packet gets sent to the host, nothing removes it from the cache. We like tuned our cache very carefully and those prefetchers will try to be smarter than you and they will be like, hey, I see a memory range somewhere there. I'm gonna overwrite what you just did. Uh, Internet moderation, I'm not even going into it. Talk will be published. There is basically an algorithm how to approach it. And when you still see your network sensors dropping packets, uh, I wrote entire document how to troubleshoot it. Like we could do a three hours workshop how to troubleshoot it, but basically an important point to remember is if you only look at uh, Zeke's uh, capture loss statistics or Zeke's uh, stats.log, you are only getting a part of the picture. The capture loss will tell you a generic, uh, that you have a generic problem, where you have a packet loss somewhere. The stats.log will tell you that you lost packets in the AF packet buffer, but maybe you are also losing uh, data at the network card level, at the host DMA area level, and so on and so forth. Uh, this we will ignore because we are running out of time. But basically, uh, I will give you the link to the document how to troubleshoot your packet loss. But it's important for you to measure your packet loss at your, if you have traffic broker before your cluster, then the network card, then the system level, and then the ZIG level. Like all of them and you summarize them. So it might be that you were thinking, I don't have packet loss. Well, you did. Mm, some quick remarks, uh, some of these 40 gigabits, dual 40 gigabits cards are actually not dual 40 gigabits, but 50 gigabits, they just have two ports. Uh, this we probably answered already. Uh, what else is interesting here? 
oh, I already told you about not making every buffer as huge as you can. Uh, do not buy and oversize your servers. If you have a server with like four CPUs, you're doing yourself not a favor, it's actually a loss of resources. It would be way better for you to buy like smaller servers, even two servers, four servers, one CPU each, with like a one giant oversized box. And in the next year, I hope to talk about the XDP, which is an ex express data path, which bypasses like 90% of what I just talked about and sends uh, packets from the network card to the uh, buffer where Z can actually read the data from the buffer, but it bypasses like 90% of the Linux network stack. So it should be way, way faster. There were some initial testing by Intel and Intel was like, hey, we can make this whole thing fly 100 gigs per second easily. So with that, I am taking a question or two, maybe if we have time and that would be it. Oh, and the link, uh, the link to everything that I just was talking about. Questions? Uh, PF reading is nice, but it does not give you anything that you don't already have in the Linux kernel. It used to be better, I agree, but nowadays with new kernels 4. whatever, you don't really gain anything by uh, using PF ring. Okay, thanks a lot.